Hi and welcome. I'm Jim Marshall of the New Bedford Cable Network and we are here for a roundtable discussion on the coronavirus and the COVID-19 vaccines that are coming out to residents here of Greater New Bedford. Joining us are Damone Chaplin, who's the New Bedford Public Health Director. Also joining us is Dr. Matthew Bivens. He's the emergency physician at St. Luke's, the St. Luke's Hospital Affiliated EMS Medical Director and the South Coast EMS Director and Dr. Anthony Carabino, who is an infectious disease specialist at the Hawthorne Medical Associates. Gentlemen, it's good to see all of you. Thanks for coming, and we appreciate you taking the time at a, at a busy time. I guess the first thing that we should probably talk about is, um, as, we, as we're looking at the vaccine and Operation War Speed and the virus, I don't know who wants to tackle it first, but what is the coronavirus? Because I still think people at this point are questioning what it is is it a big deal? Uh, either of us could probably yeah. tackle that. Um, it's a, so coronavirus, uh, I've heard it described as not that bad, but terrible, which I think is sort of captures all of our confusion about it. Yeah, the vast majority of people who get it have a mild to moderate flu-like illness, and we don't do anything special for them. They go home, they ride it out, they're fine. In fact, a lot of people seem to have it with no symptoms, which I think they're surprised by, and then, they, then they're suspicious. Why do I, how can I really have it if I don't have symptoms? But there's a small percentage of people who get quite sick with it. Small percentages don't sound concerning, but it's so contagious that everybody gets it. So a small number, like 0.1% mortality among young people age 20 to 40, 0.1%, that's 99.9%. .9%. Why do I care about this, right? That's among young people aged 20 to 40. If you multiply that by the population of those people in this country, you're looking at like 100,000 deaths just among young people, right? That's not even talking about older people who are at higher risk, people with other comorbidities. And also there's other measures to how bad something is than whether you die or not, right? There's a lot of, probably for every person who dies, there's a person who has a chronic medical condition that becomes new for them or gets much worse. So that's why we have this kind of schizophrenia about it where on the one hand, it's completely fine. No one cares, I got it, I had a sniffle, I took some Tylenol, I got better. On the other hand, we're in like a national crisis, we're social distancing, we're masking. So that's. I would just add the following, so COVID-19 is a member of a family of viruses, which is called the coronavirus. The overwhelming majority of these viruses caused the, caused the common cold. However, on two previous occasions, 2002, 2012, we saw much more serious members of the coronavirus occur. One was the original SARS virus, and the next one was the MERS virus, which is a Middle Eastern phenomenon. So the current COVID-19 virus, the SARS-2, is sort of the most recent iteration of a very a dangerous uh, a virus that normally we don't worry a whole lot about at all. At your locations, you must be seeing then the gambit of what you're talking about as well, as far as patients and, and the conditions that they have right now. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, in the emergency department at St. Luke's, where I work, um, we see everything from people coming in in a full-on panic because they have coronavirus positive test and they have a fever. And we examine them, we check their vitals, check their oxygen levels, see how they're breathing. And then they're maybe surprised, maybe angry, maybe totally relieved. And we say, yeah, you're gonna be fine, just go home. Um, and then we see people who come in um, quite sick. We've seen people come in and die. Um, we've seen people come in and need to be admitted to the hospital for days on oxygen therapy or ventilators. So, again, it's that same thing. It's, it's definitely real. It's also definitely not catastrophic for the vast majority of people who get it. But there are enough people who get very sick with it that if we ever took our foot off the brake on this, you'd see hundreds of thousands of avoidable death. And age is an issue as well. Right. So, as it was correctly stated, and this is true of all diseases, the majority of people are either asymptomatic or minimally symptomatic with the disease. 
and it's a minority that are symptomatic or extremely ill from the disease. But if you know, you do the math, a small number, a small percentage of a large number of people is still a relatively large number of people vis-a-vis -vis the capacity of our healthcare system. So that's essentially the, the complaints and the panic that's going on about healthcare resources. We do, at this point, we are close to saturating the capacity of our inpatient hospitals and ICUs. Damone, I would also wonder, too, if for people, because when you talk to people who live in the smaller communities versus the people in New Bedford, I mean, New Bedford being obviously a bigger population, I, I would assume the population matters as well when it comes to the spreading of the virus. Yeah, we're seeing that uh, within the city, um, certain pockets of the, of the city, primarily um, our African-American and Latino populations, those that are in congregate settings, we're seeing, um, you know, an increase in and um, individuals who are becoming positive with COVID. Um, I did, I'm, I'm primarily because of uh, a lot of their work conditions and their living conditions, uh, which causes them to be in close proximity to one another. And so it is affecting those populations at a different rate than the rest of the population. So that's a concern for us. And that's a big reason why we, you know, I've asked uh, uh, Dr. Carabino, um and Dr. Bivens to join us today uh, to talk about uh, some of the nuances to this particular disease. But to speak to your uh, recent question, yes, there are many well-defined risk factors for more severe COVID disease. Amongst them are obesity, older age, uh, underlying medical conditions, including those make you immunocompromised or compromise your heart and lung capacity, and obesity, which we know is, which is a major player uh, in the United States. So the government has started Operation Warp Speed. Uh, to develop vaccines to treat the coronavirus. From your standpoint, uh, define for us what is Operation Warp Speed? So Operation Warp Speed uh, is a unique private uh, uh, public uh, uh, partnership, which includes the Department of Health and Human Services, the Department of Defense, and many large pharmaceutical uh, uh, entities. The idea was to uh, invest heavily and thus expedite the development of and manufacture of diagnostic tools, uh, therapeutic tools, and what we're talking about today, vaccines. So essentially what they did, they went around uh, and then they said they looked at promising va vaccines based on some early data. So you had to have something that showed that your strategy uh, was at least possibly effective in the long run. And you had to be a sufficiently large manufacturer that you could sort of scale up production and mass produce um, uh, the vaccine in question. So then uh, what happened was that the, um, the government basically invested about $12 billion worth of money uh, in uh, eight different vaccines in about four, four standard categories. Uh, it invested heavily, as I said, basically uh, in development and manufacturing, uh, uh, and manufacturing as well, and also pre-purchased uh, large numbers of uh, uh, vials for the American public. And within roughly eight months or so uh, from the time the virus came to, that we know of, I guess, when it was declared a pandemic in March, I mean, they had two vaccines have already been approved, which uh, for some people seems unbelievable. Well, it is. The two vaccines that have been approved are from the uh, messenger RNA class, which is a novel class of uh, vaccine, uh, which was thought to be the one that could be most quickly developed and brought to market. However, there are at least other three different categories um, and six other contenders that have been invested in by the U.S. Uh, uh, Operation Warp Speed, and there's about 200 vaccines uh, that are in various stages of uh, testing and production worldwide. So the vaccine, so there's just different vaccines for, correct the same yeah. for the same illness, really. Correct. I mean, we will certainly be seeing fairly shortly more traditional vaccines, meaning protein subunit vaccines, for example, which means little pieces of uh, of the virus. So. A vaccine is essentially a chew toy for the immune system. It's injected into your system. Uh, and uh, the idea is that 
the immune system is going to learn about that, about that virus, play around with it, and cr create a robust uh, uh, army of soldiers in case the body will face it in the future. There's very many other different kinds of vaccines. In the past, for example, we've often just essentially put the, the pathogen in a blender, made a lots of proteins out of it, thrown those in. We've often, uh, uh, example, another example would be taken a, a virus, weakened it to the point that it can cause serious disease, thrown that into, thrown that into the, uh, into the body. The, what we've seen now are just the two most modern, most novel ones that are, that are available. I don't know if you wanted to add anything. It's uh, just curious to, at how quickly things develop. But I, I was seeing some doctors on, on national shows saying it really shouldn't be a surprise to people because the, from the research that's been going on for years and the, yeah. the things that have been going on, it's doable. Yeah, it's, I mean, first of all, it's an international crisis. <laughs> it's a national crisis. We've made everybody stay at home and we've crashed the economy. You know, we've, it's clearly something like World War II or a moonshot for how much the government and our top, you know, science people should be working on the fix. So I'm not surprised that they've come out quickly and aggressively. I mean, lots of these things, honestly, in some ways it's a real marker of how this is what happens if you actually invest money in public health, right? We have tons of infectious diseases around the world that could be eradicated. We've nearly eradicated polio on a dime. You know, we eradicated smallpox. The cost of it was $300 million total. $300 million. They're like swimsuits made out of diamonds you can buy that are $300 million. And we eradicated the single greatest killer of humans in history in like a decade um, for pennies. So public health, if you invest in it, pays off. You know, it's, I know people get nervous when you see something happen quickly. I don't want to be the first person tested with something. Um, and these are new vaccines, but this technology of taking messenger RNA, wrapping it up in a lipid bubble and, and injecting it so that it gets into cells to produce things, this is not something that just came up yesterday. They've been studying this for cancer treatments, for other vaccines. So it's, it's the first time we've had this as a coronavirus vaccine, but it's not, it's not completely like sci-fi or anything. It's, there's a long history of them working on this. So what's the, what's the difference, either for Dr. Carabino or Dr. Bimas, what's the difference between the process for developing this vaccine versus what a normal vaccine would go through? What was the, what's the actual piece that makes this, this process so significantly different? That well, the money. <laughs> right. I mean, the fundamental reason money. that this was done this quickly is that the clinical trials, there's multiple clin clinical trials need to be done when you're bringing a vaccine to market. Uh, some of those are safety trials, dosing trials, and effectiveness trials. Um, and then, of course, you have to scale up your manufacturing to actually um, uh, make all those doses. A lot of those things, were, traditionally, those are done one step at a time, right, because of financial risk. You're not going to throw hundreds of millions of dollars into a project that might fail. So everything is done very slowly. They wait for the results to come back before they move to the next stage. In this case, because of the large investment by the federal government, a lot of these trials could be done uh, uh, sort of in parallel, number one, instead of sequentially, and number two, the manufacturing was scaled up um, in parallel as well because the government had agreed to pre-purchase the dosing. So the fact that you could do these things at the same time uh, without uh, worry about a financial uh, ruin for one of these companies is the reason they were able to uh, make these vaccines so quickly. And as I pointed out, the messenger RNA vaccine also, it's been, uh, people have been studying it for over two decades, but it was also th thought by its nature to be, to be the one that would be easiest to bring to market. Is but there a but link, the other ones are coming. Is there a length of time, though, that has to be done in order for a vaccine Again, when you're looking at the speed of it being done as it was, is there a length of time that the trial has to take place so that there is documentation that, yes, this works? Well, well first of all, you have to understand this. One of the vaccines you actually have now is EUA, Emergency Use Authorization. They do not have full FDA approval. 
the reason they don't have. So what that means is that they can be used in the context of the ongoing emergency. Typically, vaccines take years to come to market, and typically for full FDA approval, at least six months of safety data uh, has to be presented. Uh, all the trials were done. Everything that needed to be done, the data was, was presented. However, the long-term follow-up uh, is limited at this point to about two months. Hence, the sort of emergency use authorization and not the full approval. So, the other, so there, there are other questions that we get. Um, obviously, I want to make sure we use this time as effectively as possible. Number, number one is side effects. Um, what are the potential contraindications of the vaccine? And then number two is the le length of uh, efficacy. How long are we, you know, is this going to be a vaccine that needs to be taken every annually? or biannually, or every three months. Um, either one of you guys want to jump on that question. I'll tackle the side effects. How about that? <laughs> so they seem minor. Um, you, uh, we both got the first doses of the vaccines. Um, I, I got the Pfizer one, I think. Um, I'm not sure what you got. Pfizer as well. Pfizer, yeah. It just what, you don't really have a choice. It's just what shows up you get. Um, the, and I had zero side effects. Most people I know have had zero side effects. They're saying that some people are getting some irritation at the injection site, which isn't uncommon for any vaccine. Some people feel some mild viral illness symptoms, some achiness, maybe a fever. Um, and that's traditional for vaccines. You know, like Dr. Karabinov was saying, they're a chew toy for the immune system. You, you throw it into the blood system, the immune system sees it. Um, it says, oh, we're going to attack this in future. So they, it ramps up. And fever is your body's natural immune response. It wants to bake out the infection or, you know, that, that's what happens. So if you turn, turn on, rev up the immune system a little bit with a vaccination, you might feel a little bit of that. But that's natural. That doesn't mean that you're having an allergic reaction or anything like that. There have been some scattered, very few cases of allergic reaction report or suspicion. There's one just a few days ago from a doctor in Boston who felt like he was having an allergic reaction. If these are true allergic reactions, isn't even fully clear. People sometimes just feel wrong and get upset. Um, I'm not saying anything about what happened in Boston. I don't know anything about that. Um, so it seems quite safe. And, you know, you have to gauge the risk of you feeling like a one in 10,000 type event, 99.999% chance you're gonna be fine getting a vaccine and be protected going forward versus the pretty serious potential for problems if you get COVID-19. You know, most people are fine, but you lose weeks often to feeling sick and there's risk of death even in young people and you know, serious medical problems and people who don't die. So. Most of us in medicine are pretty savvy about being suspicious of new medications. All we do all day long is a medication comes out and we immediately start trashing it. Well, this thing doesn't work. Is this thing safe? What's the study on this? You know, how many studies have there been? I know of nobody in medicine who hasn't been like, I want to take that vaccine. That seems like a clear risk benefit for me. We all you know, lined up for it. I mean, the public should expect commonly to uh, experience sort of minor nuisance uh, side effects after vaccination. Those typically occur, consist of local reactions, meaning if your arm gets red, it gets warm, it gets swollen, it gets painful. And now the other common side effects are headache and fatigue. Very, very common. If you're getting the vaccine, you should almost expect to have those. Serious side effects have been very few. Um, in terms of the long-term efficacy, you know, something I think the public gets upset with is that uh, public declarations keep changing. And, that, and it makes the medical community, in their eyes, look stupid. Uh, but the bottom line is we're dealing with a novel virus, uh, novel vaccines, and novel therapeutic agents. So our knowledge base keeps changing. When they talk about the vaccine being 95% efficacious in, 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 in uh, uh, avoiding COVID-19 disease, that was during a, a very short trial. So we don't know what the long-term 
uh, protection that's offered by this vaccine is. Um, we don't know, for example, whether this new novel strain that first came to fame in, in London is, is going to be effectively uh, neutralized by the vaccine. Um, and we even don't know whether people who have had the disease uh, and recovered how durable their immune uh, protection is. So those answers are essentially unknown. Is there a difference between, right now we have the Pfizer and the Moderna, and when you, you hear that Pfizer has to be kept in you know, sub-zero cold and Moderna can be at room temperature, is there a difference between the two vaccines, so much so that you should pick one or the other? That reflects the stability of the vaccine. I mean, essentially, the messenger RNA particle is very uh, 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 I think it's a lip fragile, it's but a li the lip is, so it's enveloped, right, in this, in this sort of a fatty yeah. or so-called lipid environment, um, vessel, to protect it. And the stability of that is what makes the difference between the temperatures uh, that are required. So I guess the, so the... But in terms of efficacy, they have the same efficacy at this point, and the, the, there's no reason for the uh, public to choose one or the other. It'll just be, it'll just, uh, be based on what's available. And, if, and again, if people don't like this new vaccine, these new vaccines uh, because they are so new and untested, they are certainly entitled to wait longer and more traditional vaccines uh, will be on the, uh, on the market. And so it's, it's interesting. When we first started this, uh, I was in uh, D.C. in February when this first hit the United States. Um, we were called to the White House, uh, a group of us that I belong to Nature, which is a local health uh, association. We were called to the White House. Uh, one of the terms that was used, which I thought was interesting, was immunologically illiterate. Our bodies were immunologically illiterate. So talking to this idea about it being novel, being new to our bodies and why it's it's so scary. Uh, and then the other concern um, that we've been hearing about um, is about comorbidities. Are there specific comorbidities, i.e., high blood pressure, diabetes, asthma, uh, COPD, or sickle cell anemia, that people with those conditions should be concerned about with this particular vaccine, or either one of them, the Pfizer or I, um, I mean, I guess I would say that list of comorbidities uh, yeah, you should be concerned about COVID. Um, so your risk benefit for getting vaccinated to prevent COVID just got even more in favor of the vaccine. So if you're a young, healthy person with no medical problems whatsoever, um, getting vaccinated still is a good risk benefit for you because the likelihood you'll have a problem from the vaccine is so much lower than the admittedly low risk that you'll have a problem with COVID. It's still a better deal. Um, and you could argue for getting vaccinated as a young person to try and protect all the other people in your life. We don't have actual evidence yet that getting vaccinated keeps you from catching and spreading the disease. All we have is some evidence that getting vaccinated keeps you from feeling sick and you know catching the disease in the first place. But it seems logical that if you're not catching the disease, you're not going to spread it. So, um, you know, as a, like protecting your community, you could, as a young person, want to get the vaccine. But if you have comorbidities, it's highly like playing the odds. The odds favor you getting the vaccine. Yeah, I mean, the comorbidities that you mentioned, kidney disease, diabetes, over, uh, high blood pressure, heart, lung disease, none of those are contraindications to getting the vaccine. In fact, what those are, a list of, of conditions which put you at risk of more severe COVID-19 disease. Uh, so that should increase your interest in getting immunized if you actually have those conditions. The only contraindication to getting the vaccine at this point is a history of anaphylaxis or severe allergic reaction to the contents of the vaccine. I'm curious as to if um, people who have already had the virus, do they still need to get the vaccine? The answer is yes. So, but we're not, also we're not entirely sure. What is the duration of natural immunity? At this point in time, it's believed to be about three months. If you've had the disease and gotten past it, 
Um, it's believed that you have immunity to reinfection at least three months long. And, and maybe maybe longer, right? Yeah. So there've been few. There've been very few reinfections, right? right? Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It might well be longer. Some people are stretching to six months. The bottom line is, though, we don't know the duration of natural immunity. So again, every single person who had the disease indeed should be vaccinated. If they wish to delay, they may delay up to three months because that's considered the time we give them for natural immunity. But they, are, they absolutely should be lining up to get the vaccine as well. And so so the, as both of you probably have heard, and this idea about mutation, the virus mutating, um, it's, it's in the news now. We're hearing it in, in, in the UK and other places. Um, and then the other, the other conversation is about when do we get to quote unquote herd immunity? Um, do, you, do either one you want to shed some light on either one of those topics, the mutation of a virus and, um, and the effect of this vaccine on it? And then also, at what point can a community start to think about herd immunity and how do they get there? Well, with regard to these uh, mutations in the virus, all viruses, all biological entities mutate. That that comes from errors when the virus replicates itself and it makes mistakes. And as a result, it's a little different the second time than the third time and the fourth time. How it's different is a completely random phenomenon. What we worry about is that the vaccines are designed to target the so-called spike protein. It's a little, if you see those little pictures of the COVID virus, it's got little umbrellas hanging off its, all over its parts. Those are the so-called spike proteins uh, which the virus uses to attach to cells and infect them. So the target of the vaccine is to neutralize those spike proteins. So the question is, well, what happens if those spike proteins mutate? As I pointed out, a mutation can occur anywhere, right? Uh, you know, I, I might become more handsome or I might grow a tail, right? I mean, I, we don't know what's going to happen. So if, if to the extent that the uh, mutations um, affect the spike protein, then we've got a problem. Because um, in that case, we would expect our vaccine to be less effective. Uh, up to this point, you know, people have thought that the virus was basically fairly genetically stable, and that raised hopes for vaccination. Because if a thing was changing every single day or every week, right, you wouldn't have a stable target uh, to develop a vaccine against. So the idea that it was stable was very important conceptually. We, this new virus uh, that's been identified actually all over the place uh, does have uh, changes in its, in its spike protein. And we're unsure as to whether the current vaccines will be effective or equally effective against this particular virus. Time will have to tell. And that's why it's important to monitor the virus by uh, so-called genotyping or figuring out what its gene looks like every so often. It turned out that the reason it was actually found in the UK was because London was doing a lot of this. They were monitoring very frequently and, it found, and we found that unfortunately the CDC wasn't doing the same job. Now that we're looking, we're seeing the virus everywhere. I'm curious as to why the need for two shots when you get the COVID vaccine. Um, you know, some people say, well, I just get one shot, but you really need two. So what's the purpose of the, the second shot? I thought the first one sort of uh, sensitized the immune system and the second one just basically re-irritated it to the point that it said, okay, now I know this is coming. I'm going to start ramping up. Well, we shouldn't be surprised at the fact that it required more than one shot. A lot of our vaccines require more right. than one shot, right? Hepatitis B is a series of two shots. Pneumonia has two shots. Lots of these vaccines come as, as a series of shots. So that's not surprising. Typically, it's just another kick in the pants to the immune system. What's interesting, for example, with regard to the uh, uh, Pfizer vaccine, is if you only get the first shot, it turns out you'll end up down the road with about 80 percent protection against the virus versus the 95 percent with the two shots. So it's just an extra kick in the pants, right? Every time you get a shot, a, a shot, you throw this chew toy into the bloodstream and the immune system practices with it and, and develops an army of soldiers. The more times you do that, this time we haven't found two, 
uh, you get the absolute maximum benefit. And that's in the research they tr try to figure out how many shots, you know, produces, are necessary to create really long, effective immunity. And, and, and there's, a, there's a time frame to get that second shot, correct? Three to four weeks, it depends. It, but a lot of this is, they'll say three weeks for one, four weeks for the other. It's not because there's something particularly special about those time frames. That's just what they studied. So, you know, lots of times when we say you take an antibiotic for seven days, if you took it for six days or eight days, it would probably be the same, but we studied seven days because we picked that number, right? So they pick, they, they, some of this stuff is a little bit artificial and just based on the guidelines we set out when we decided to study something, okay, we proved it works that way, we're going to do it that way. Yeah, I want to talk about this, this surge capacity, the real threat of COVID, because people are saying, it's a common cold, it's the flu, what's the big deal? And I don't think that there's enough understanding about surge capacity. In other words, how, did this, how does this virus impact our healthcare system and our ability to respond to the folks who are getting sick? That, that, you know. we, were, we were talking about that a little earlier and you were mentioning some other places in the world. Yeah, I mean, the, the issue with, with uh, having lots of sick people at, at the same time has to do with our medical capacity. And as we talked about the numbers, you, even though the majority of COVID virus infections are mild to moderate, uh, a, a certain fra real fraction of those, about 20%, can be very serious and, and require medical care, potentially even in the ICU. The problem is we only have so much, uh, so many health professionals, so many ventilators, so many beds. Um, so when people talk about letting everyone just get sick, you know, and get this over with as, as fast as possible to get to the so-called herd immunity, uh, that's fine, except that large numbers of Americans will suffer and die needlessly because there won't be the people uh, and the machines and the drugs and the doctors and the nurses to take care of them. Uh, that's Wednesday in a developing country. Where I work in developing countries, th that's exactly what Wednesday looks like. The, the, and in those countries, people accept the fact that resources are limited and they may not uh, be taken care of and they may simply die for, from lack of resources availability. Uh, that's not the case in the United States of America. We uh, anticipate plentiful, endless amounts of high-end medical care. So uh, we will not go down uh, lightly uh, with, with, uh, if the, populate, uh, po the sick population surges and we can't take care of them. And that's the key difference. You see, when uh, the dispute people are having with Dr. Atlas and others about herd immunity was, her, herd immunity basically means, it's the same way you, uh, a fire will go, will go out when there's no more wood to burn. If most people are immune to the, uh, to the virus and then, I get it, and there's nobody around me to jump to, then the virus dies with me, right? Um, normally, we get to herd immunity by vaccinating the population. A lot of people are trying to get to herd immunity by just letting everyone get sick. So again, if you're, if you're satisfied with your mother lying on the floor of the emergency room, neglected because there are simply no more doctors, no more drugs, no ICU bed, no more staff, then that's the way to go. If, however, you want people to be uh, taken care of adequately within the limitations of our healthcare service, then we have to do something differently. And that's why surge capacity is important. I've had questions asked about uh, the cost of, the, of getting the shot, just the average person. Um, uh, people are, are, are concerned, are they going to be able to afford to get the shots? Um, so, you were telling me some stuff before so according our to the, show. Yeah, the federal government has said it's free. In 2020 and 2021, it's pre-purchased, it's free to everybody. Now, everybody will, I, I can't promise you that nobody will figure out a way to try and get around that and charge you something for it uh, because you know, it's America. But um, it's supposed to be completely free to anybody who wants it this year or next year. Yeah. And so the state, uh, I think a good, a good point to wrap up is the state has, um, they have a vaccination plan, and it has, in, in my opinion, the plan is in three phases, but in reality, I think it's really two phases. 
Um, the first phase is focused on protecting specific sectors of the community. And then the second phase is, is really focused on uh, um, getting the vaccines to critical populations. And so um, in this particular, you know, in the way that the state has, will be rolling out um, the distribution of the vaccine, we will see healthcare workers um, and our first responders and our nursing home residents and affiliates vaccine first um, as you know those being really important sectors where we're seeing a large majority of our, our fatalities are happening in nursing homes and in individuals over the age of 70. So but this next um, if we were as we, as we begin to wrap up this conversation for the next round the phase two and phase three of the the distribution what message would you for those folks that are on the fence um, who are not sure if they really um, should or want to get this vaccine what message would you send to them i know i have my own personal message and i'll share after you guys are done but what message would you want to share with them right now i uh i guess i would say um just keep an open mind and um try to keep out of all the politics and craziness with this. I feel like this has gone lots of different ways over the past year. Um, and I know people, there's an element that's felt very bossy, I think, where, you know, put on your mask, social distance, it's all commands. And at the same time, people look at those of us who are involved in coming up with those strategies and say, you guys don't know what you're doing, you're all over the place. You said this last week, that this week. And it's true, it's an evolving situation and we're doing our best trying to figure out what's the best advice we can give. Um, I'm not the government, I don't wanna be telling people what to do. All we can do is tell you what we understand. If you want my personal opinion, I'm pretty stingy about medicine. I'm not a big believer in everybody getting a medication every time they want one. I think there's a lot of medical care that's you know, done by tradition and doesn't have great backing. Vaccinations have historically been like our best triumph in medicine. They have saved hundreds of millions of lives. They've been proved to be safe ever since like the, whenever it was that they first noticed that milkmaids got cowpox and we could just, you know, bring them by and prevent kids from getting smallpox. Um, you know, this is something we've been doing for centuries now, I guess. Um, and it's, so uh, I think that getting vaccinated is for the person himself or herself taking the vaccine is 99.999% of the time a great deal. You protect yourself, you protect your family, you protect other people at a zero-ish cost to you. That would be my opinion, but I'm not telling anybody what they have to do. We will not treat ourselves out of this pandemic. You know, our treatment modalities are few and not particularly effective. If we want to go beyond where we are now, uh, we're going to have to use the vaccine and we're going to have to use the basic uh, uh, social di distancing uh, measures that people have been talking about since the beginning. That's how we're going to get out of this, uh, out of this crisis. So uh, invest, uh, vaccination, wearing a mask, et cetera, um, our acts of common decency, uh, not only do they, not only are they a manifestation of self-interest because you yourself don't get, get ill, they're also a manifestation of common decency. You are, you're protecting others uh, from potentially getting sick from you. Um, I, I have never quite understood the uh, idea that a mask was this uh, incredible infringement on someone's personal rights. You know, it's really a matter of common decency towards your fellow man. How did we get to a point that uh, 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 wearing a mask became a litmus test of political conviction? Um, or we were so uh, angry about masks that we refused to wear them uh, with zero consideration for what, what would happen to other people? So. Just had two quick things and I'll let Damone wrap up. So in the meantime, before we get the shot, the, the advice that we've been given 
is still the advice we should have until we get the vaccine. Yeah. The North other side. question. Mm -hmm. No, go ahead. I just going to say we're. I mean, at this point, we're well along in this. We've paid huge prices to get here, um, and I agree that wearing a mask is a sign of you should be proud that you're doing what you can do to help everybody and protect yourself. I have a little bit more sympathy for the people who are angry because the pandemic and the shutdowns of restaurants and businesses have crashed people's livelihoods. And we're seeing people in the emergency department, not just with COVID, but also with like out of control depression, with suicidality, substance abuse. And we're also seeing people who are so scared to come that they stayed at home with their heart attack or their stroke. So, and that you're seeing people, everything gets worse when you lose your job and you can't pay your bills. So there have been huge costs to even the treatment we prescribed to try and prevent this. I've sometimes described it as like a dangerous chemotherapy we're doing. You know, it, it has costs, even if it is the only good treatment. So, but at this point we've paid most of those costs. You know, you've already been through the course of chemotherapy. You're certainly gonna wear a mask and social distance for the next few months, at least, while we get through the winter and spring and um, you know, figure out vaccine. And I, and I wanted to give you guys a chance too, because you had mentioned both of you off camera, um, the need for people throughout this to continue to get health care, not COVID related. You were both pretty adamant about that. Yeah. 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 One of the uh, costs of the COVID epidemic has been delayed uh, health care in other areas. Cancer screening, colonoscopies, mammograms, pap smears, routine care for uh, blood pressure, cholesterol, diabetes. I mean, those uh, are crucially important. And if we neglect them or delay them, we will simply pay a price down the road. And some things can be delayed a little bit. And, you know, I know if you're a, if you're a patient hearing that, you're probably thinking, great, but my doctor can't get me in. Um, because COVID and because of everything else. Uh, but there is telemedicine. We've put a lot of effort into making it so that for some chronic conditions and other things, we can see you through the TV or the video and um, discuss. And then if you feel like you're having a real serious health problem acutely, um, don't decide not to come to the hospital because maybe there's COVID there. There's COVID everywhere, first of all. And second of all, at the hospital, we're pretty good about dividing things into hot and cold zones. I'm speaking of any hospital in Massachusetts. The protocols are the same. And you're not going to get COVID from hospital workers. We actually have had very few COVID cases among the ER, even though we have been seeing COVID patients every day. I saw half a dozen COVID patients last night, um, and that's normal for me. But we wear higher levels of protective gear than just the mask. I mean, if you don't like the mask, try wearing these N95 masks on your face for eight hours. You're, so, uh, but that works. We have had very few cases, and all of the cases I know of among the ER doctors, they got it. Only like four or five of us have gotten it so far, and it was all from a like another family member, not from work. So, it's safe to come to the hospital, and if you have a real problem, you should. No, I, I think um, they've hit on pretty much all of the. Um, topics, the, the larger topics that I think are of interest right now. Um, I think what I walk away with this is that uh, handle with care. Um, we are, we're, we are, from a, I was going to use a sports analogy. Um, we are um, in the third quarter of this thing and um, the score is tied and there's, you know, it can go a bunch of different ways, but we're looking down the barrel right now. And so um, I think my message is to handle with care and uh, to Dr. Carabino's point, uh, we have to think about the greater common good, right? And, and, and wearing your mask and doing all the non-pharmaceutical interventions that we've been doing, the social distancing, and now we've gotten to this point where we have kind of, you know, our mega tool and we have to try and use it as best we can, and that being the vaccine. So uh, with that, I'm hoping that everyone who's watching this, they learned something that they didn't know before they saw this video and that we have an opportunity to um, to help them in making their decisions going forward. Dr. And, Robin, did you and, and people should check your websites, check information when, when shots are available, I'm assuming, um, when they know when it's time. 
Yeah, we will. Um, we have been um, updating our web page pretty regularly with our COVID numbers, um, with our Stop the Spread sites. Um, we will also start to um, post on the web page also our vaccination sites, and we will be doing that. So we anticipate for the city of New Bedford, uh, we will be supporting communities, the, the neighboring communities with their first responders for vaccines, and we will most likely be employing some level of um, stationary and mobile vaccination clinics throughout the city. And I would assume South Coast and Hawthorne are the, are the same thing. If you're a patient of either one of those, just keep up to date, I guess. Yes. And we're waiting to hear ourselves. The vaccines come to us through DPH, come to DPH from the federal government. So um, we're as eager as everybody else is to find out what the ultimate details are of how it will unfold. All right. Sounds good. And that's going to do it. Uh, my thanks right. to uh, Dr. Carabino and Dr. Bevins, and along with Damone, for coming in to talk about this. If you have any questions, we'll have the websites up there, and um, people can contact the facilities and contact the health department as well to uh, get the questions answered. I still think there's a, a still questions out there that don't have answers yet, but um, they'll come along as, as time goes on. So uh, my thanks to the folks for watching us. And uh, again, thanks to the crew for helping us out here at Fort Tabor Community Center. I'm Jim Marshall, the New Bedford Cable Network. Thanks for watching, and we'll talk to you again soon.